Thanks so much. All right, is my mic live? All good? Thank you. You read that introduction just like my mother wrote it. I appreciate that. So, so let me give a little, a little framing uh, for why uh, I'm here today to talk a little bit about the industries and executives of the future. And since it's, it's right after lunch, I know that every now and then people need a little bit of a pick-me-up. So I'll try to be a little bit provocative. Uh, I say when two people agree about everything, only one person is doing the thinking. Uh, so I'll try to put enough content out there uh, to provoke, you know, perhaps some new thinking, but also hopefully a point of disagreement or two. Uh, as was mentioned, you know, my, my, I have sort of a strange background, you know, and, and one thing that doesn't appear uh, in any of my bios, but what is the first referenced in the first sentence of my book is I'm a public school kid from West Virginia who put himself through college in part uh, by working as a midnight janitor. So I was lucky, you know, I went to, you know, public school in a, rel in a relatively tough and poor part of West Virginia, and while my friends at, at my fancy college went off to their unpaid internships at investment banks and law firms and, you know, got apartments for the summer in Washington, D.C., I had to go back during the summer and make money. And the jobs that were available uh, back then in the early 1990s uh, when I was in college were working on a beer truck and working as a midnight janitor. And the first line from my book, which I think all of you have a copy of, The Industries of the Future, is, it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm whopping, mopping up whiskey smelling puke after a country music concert in Charleston, West Virginia. Uh, sort of an unsettling image after lunch. Uh, but but I, I, I evoke that experience of working as a midnight janitor in part because I, I, the men who I worked shoulder to shoulder with on the janitorial crew for whom that job was not merely a summer job but was you know, at what ought to have been the peak of their, of their earnings in their 40s and 50s, you know, I couldn't help but think that you know, 10 or 20 or 30 years er earlier those men would have had jobs in ports, factories, mines, or mills, you know, making a good union wage, employer-based health insurance, and other such things. And I saw what happened where I was growing up and where I was then an inner city school teacher for a number of years in inner city Baltimore for communities urban and rural that did not adapt to the last stage of globalization uh, and technology-fueled innovation. And so fast forward 20 some odd years, how old am I now? I'm 44 years old. So fast forward 20 some odd years, I wrote this book, The Industries of the Future, in part to sort of light a little path so that a broader set of stakeholders uh, can understand the forces that are gonna shape our future, uh, principally the economic forces. Uh, you know, I have a background, sort of the typical, it's like at this point, it's an utter cliche of you know, the young American entrepreneur. So after being an inner, city, an inner city teacher, I was not then smart or experienced enough to know that I shouldn't start a company. Um, and I, I perceived an opportunity in the marketplace, started a company without two nickels to rub together in a basement of a company. That company, over the course of eight years, grew large and, glu and grew global. Uh, it was from that that uh, I ran technology and media policy for Barack Obama's presidential campaign in 2007 and 2008, which then led to my most interesting executive search experience. Uh, so, you know, I was on the presidential transition team. My stock was pretty high for having run tech and media policy for this successful presidential campaign. And I get summoned to see Hillary Clinton. Uh, now, I helped beat Hillary Clinton. And I was like, why does she want to see me? Does she want to like yell at me? And so I, I go to see her um, and she goes, Alec, I thought I was going to be president. Uh, she goes, and I have a very large cadre of people who would have filled the executive ranks of the federal government. She goes, now I need to fit them all into one department, the State Department. She goes, but I need to make one exception. She goes, I need one of you innovation people. Uh, and she goes, you know, you guys whooped me pretty good during the presidential campaign, so, you know, come work for me. You can make up your own title, which is why I got a cool title like Senior Advisor for Innovation to the Secretary of State. 
And she says, and you know, look, there are 196 countries on planet Earth. You and I are going to work on 195 of them together. So that definitely went down as the strangest executive search experience I've been a part of, uh, but ultimately a very rewarding one. I, I just regret that this conversation took place after her email was set up. Uh, <laughs> you know, maybe I would have come up with a little different solution for her. And so I, I worked at, at her elbow for four years, and in the three years since, I became obsessed with the following question. If the 20 years from 1995 to 2015, if the story of those 20 years is really the story of digitization and the rise of the internet, if the rise of the internet did as much as anything to transform economic systems, political systems, and communication systems, what's next? What's going to be the story of 2016 to 2026? And so that's the basis of this book that I wrote, The Industries of the Future. It's doing really well. It just came out two months ago, uh, February 2nd of this year. But uh, Simon & Schuster published it. It's, it's doing well. It's in its sixth printing in just two months. Uh, we've sold the rights for 14 different countries. It's a New York Times bestseller again this week. And I think the reason for that is just because there is so much opacity about very complicated technical topics that we all want to understand from artificial intelligence and robotics to genomics to big data to cybersecurity and all these other fields. But they're technical, they're boring, they're complicated, and, and it's difficult, I think, oftentimes for people who aren't engineers to want to understand these issues and then to commit to understand these issues. Uh, but I do think that, that these kinds of fields are going to drive the industries of the future. And what I'm trying to do in front of as many audiences as possible is make this stuff accessible in non-engineering language and to develop some theses which I think are broadly applic applicable. And I want to I share some of those theses with you today and then do my best to map it against what I think the profiles of the leaders of some of these industries will be. Uh, and then I'd love to leave some time at the end, rather than just give a 50 minute monologue now, I'd love to leave some time at the end for some question and answer. I'm not a diplomat anymore, so I would very much welcome undiplomatic questions. Uh, those tend to be the most interesting. Thesis one, land was the raw material of the agricultural age, iron, was the raw material of the industrial age. Data is the raw material of the information age. He who owned the land and controlled the land during the agricultural age had the economic power and had the political power. He who owned the factories and controlled access to the natural resources during the industrial age had the economic power and had the political power. He or she who owned the data, controlled the data, or can draw meaning from the data in today and tomorrow's economy are those who are building the multi-billion dollar industries and businesses of the future. Uh, and it's fascinating me, to me to study this field of data right now. 90% of the world's data has been created in the last two years. 90% of the world's information has been generated in the last two years. And in fact, if you take the earliest recordings of mankind, literally the paintings on cave walls, the sum of the information, the sum of the data produced from painting on cave walls to the year 2003, we now produce every two days. All of the information produced from the earliest recordings of mankind to the year 2003, we now produce every two days. Uh, last year, we produced about five zettabytes worth of data. A zettabyte is 10 to the 21st power of data. Uh, and these are, this, this data, this information, is largely produced by what are now 16 billion networked devices. So 16 billion is the sum of our, of our internet connected smartphones, our laptops, our iPads, the sensors 
that are in supply chains. Today, in April of 2016, that number is 16 billion. Four years from now, which is not that long from now, four years is not a long time, that number will, will go from 16 billion to 40 billion. So what that means is, is as disorienting as digitization has been over the last 10 years, as it has simultaneously created and destroyed business models, the pace of that is not going to slow. And in fact, we see an acceleration of it. And what's interesting about going from 16 billion to 40 billion networked devices is it's largely not for personal communications. It's not that we're gonna be putting cell phones in each of our pockets. It's that we are gonna be increasingly networking devices that today aren't networked from household appliances to cars to very significantly for this audience are supply chains. Supply chains are gonna grow, as sophisticated as supply chains are today, they're gonna grow enormously more sophisticated over the next four years. And so this data then, uh, and being able to draw meaning out of actionable business intelligence, out of this Pacific Ocean worth of data that we're creating is becoming the foundation for the creation of new industries, new businesses. It is the foundation for taking fields that are relatively small or modestly sized today and enabling their substantial growth. And third, it is going to take big industries that are centuries old, millennia old, like farming, agriculture, and have really interesting impacts in those. And so a couple, couple examples by way of illustration. One, the commercialization of genomics. Uh, we're now 15 years past the mapping of the human genome. And when the human genome, the 25, we, we are all made up of about between 20 and 25,000 genes in our bodies, and the mapping of the terabytes of data that went into a single human genome. When that happened the first time, it cost $2.7 billion. Uh, when my friend Steve Jobs, before he died five years ago, had his genome mapped, it cost $100,000. Today, it costs $1,000. $2.7 billion 15 years ago, $100,000 five years ago, $1,000 today. Now, what is the meaning of that in economic terms? What that means is that the kinds of diagnostics and precision medicines that have been long hoped for since the genome was first mapped are going to commercialize in the next 10 years. And as a result of that, the world's last trillion dollar industry was built out of computer code the world's next trillion dollar industry is going to be built out of genetic code. This is, it's kind of funny, this was explained to me by a guy who I played racquetball with. Uh, I play racquetball in Baltimore, and there's this guy who for a couple years, I thought, I thought he was a gym rat. He's sort of crazy gray hair, big gray beard, dingy old headband, wears a knee brace on the outside of his 1970s style gray sweatpants. You know, brings his racquetball gear to the court in an old Samsonite suitcase. Turns out this guy, Bert Vogelstein, is the world's most cited living scientist. <laughs> this is what happens when you play racquetball near Johns Hopkins. Um, it was his team at Hopkins working with a few others which figured out how, mu how mutations in proteins, uh, 30 some odd years ago, how mutations in proteins cause cancer. Kind of a big deal. And what his team and a variety of others working at Stanford, the University of Iowa, and, uh, and some others have done is they have figured out how the vial of blood uh, that you know, we all now get taken at all of our annual checkups to check for things like our cholesterol level, what Dr. Vogelstein and his team of 70 researchers have figured out is by sequencing the genetic material in that blood, they can detect cancerous cells at one one-hundredth the size of what can be detected by an MRI. 
What that means is that cancers that we now routinely find in stages three or four, once people begin feeling badly, uh, we now will be able to identify early in stage one uh, when they're far more curable and before people have become symptomatic. Uh, what's more, the ability now of being able to sequence the genetic material of our illnesses uh, will, will unleash innovation in the life sciences that make medicine it, as it is practiced today look primitive by comparison. So right now, you know, when you go to see your doctor, you describe how you're feeling, you, you hand over the system, you hand over your symptoms basically, maybe you get a, a test or two taken, and then the doctor identifies one or two medicines for you, and the level of personalization is if you're heavy, it's one dosage, if you're skinny, it's another dosage. Uh, the kinds of personalized medicines that are made possible by genomics will allow for the sequencing of, the, uh, of, our, of our cells and the development of precision medicines that instead of it being the one medicine that is prescribed to everybody, will map to your specific genetic makeup. And so the, in talking to the researchers on this, they think that as this mainstreams, the combination of the early diagnostics and the precision medicine will add three to five years of life expectancy in societies where this mainstreams. And so, you know, I, I think this is a pretty big de deal. And it's all fueled by our now being able to draw meaning out of the, out of the data that is compacted in our, in our body's 20,000 genes. Uh, there are other fascinating innovations that I think are going to come that, you know, are going to create industries that we don't, businesses that we don't even think of as businesses and will make them really consequential and, and again, rooted in data uh, at its foundation. So, you know, I don't know about you, but 30 years ago when I was a teenager and I traveled out of the country the, for the first time, the way that, uh, you know, the way that I would travel if I wanted to translate something is I had one of those little pocket dictionaries. It was like, you know, English, French, or English, Italian, and if you wanted to construct a sentence, you would spend five sentences sort of going through that little pocket dictionary, and you would then, you know, sort of blather it out with unconjugated verbs, the closest approximation of the noun possible, and then you would just hope people wouldn't speak back, but they would be like, bathroom's there, right? Today's version of that is Google Translate. So today, there are about a billion translate, translations done a day by about 200 million people, so that if you go to a country where you don't speak the language, you can type it into your mobile phone, and you know you can try to say it, or you can show it on the screen to the person uh, whose language you don't speak, but the result is sort of the same. It's still, you know, you don't want them to say anything back to you because you don't understand them. You hope they'll just sort of point, you know, bathroom's there. You know, what I imagine will come next uh, is in 10 years, uh, when somebody is speaking a language to us that we don't understand, we'll have an earpiece in our ear. And at the speed of sound, as people are speaking the language that we don't understand, there will be a little whisper in our ear of exactly what they're saying. And it won't be in like the series voice because of advances in bioacoustic engineering, measuring the fre frequency, wavelength, sound intensity, and other properties of the voice, it will actually sound like the voice of the person who's speaking to you, but it'll be speaking the language that you are comfortable hearing. And when I think about this, I think about uh, how much, I think about how this will accelerate globalization. I think about countries that today we consider to be fairly inaccessible, like, Indonesia. Sure, people in Jakarta and Bali, there are enough people there that speak English or French, uh, but there's 650 more islands there that are ripe with natural resources, ripe with agricultural resources, uh, but they're largely inaccessible because on these hundreds and hundreds of islands, people speak hundreds and hundreds of languages. I think about places like Papua New Guinea, home to 20% to of the world's tuna and vast stores of natural resources. The reason why people don't travel to or do business in Papua New Guinea 
is in significant measure because people speak 850 languages. And so I imagine in five, six, seven years, some of the things that the business leaders who you are counseling, some of the things that they are gonna be grappling with on a geoeconomic basis are gonna be informed by some really fascinating innovations uh, that are to come. And it's gonna create new things like earpieces in our ears that speak languages that you know we wouldn't understand. But it's also gonna transform existing big industries. So I think about agriculture, for example. Um, the ability to generate data about farm fields, I think is going to have the biggest impact on the field of agriculture since the Green Revolution after World War II. Uh, and I, I became convinced of this, you know, my, my assistant totaled up my travel recently. She did me the disservice of this. And apparently I have traveled in recent years the equivalent of two round trips to the moon with a side trip to New Zealand. Uh, literally 25 circumferences of the globe. And you know, I really sort of, I became passionate about the impact of data in agriculture, so-called precision agriculture, after being in the North Island of New Zealand and talking to the farmers there about why the financial crisis did not really hit New Zealand. And they said it's because they're an agriculture-based economy and in the face of the financial crisis, what they did is they innovated. Now, apparently in New Zealand, there are many more cows uh, than there are human beings. And as China, was, as China was rising throughout much of the 2000s, these Kiwi dairy farmers wanted to figure out how they could export beef and dairy products to the growing middle class in China. Now the way that cattle farming had existed in New Zealand had been largely unchanged for a couple hundred years. You know, it was you know, big men with calluses on their hands and ranches with thousands, if not tens of thousands, of cattle. And what they did is they began working with a local software company and they developed a precision agriculture product called Pasture Meter. And what Pasture Meter does is it combines GPS with laser technology and it takes 18,500 measurements per field. Uh, and what that basically, how that impacts the behavior of the farmer is that instead of the farmer saying, oh, it's Monday, it's time for me to water the field, or oh, it's Tuesday, it's time for me to put more feed in the paddock, or oh, it's Wednesday, it's time for me to put the fertilizer out. What it does is it suddenly takes relatively small areas and it says you need to put precisely this amount of water in this area. You need to put precisely this amount of fertilizer in this area. And oh, here's the exact phosphorus nitrogen mix you need. Oh, here's where you need to put feed in the paddock. Now that sounds slightly ridiculous, but what it did is one year after the creation of this technology, exports of beef and, and dairy products to China went up 498% and no financial crisis in New Zealand. And so what's interesting to me less about this than sort of the gizmos and the gadgets that emerge left next is what does this mean macroeconomically and what does this mean microeconomically? You know, what does it mean for the future of the firms? And there are a handful of questions uh, for which some people, uh, on which some people have religious views. I tend to take a little bit more balanced view on this, but I do think it's relevant for you as you think through your issues about how you counsel business leaders. Number one, will these big innovations come um, from platform companies, from the big owners of data like the Googles, the Facebooks, the Apples, the Amazons, or from people who don't necessarily know anything about a field uh, like Travis Kalanick who created Uber or Brian Chesky who created Airbnb, neither of whom knew anything about transportation or about lodging, but they did know how to build a technology product and how to manage data. Will all of this innovation come from sort of Silicon Valley geeks 
uh, irrespective of domain expertise? Or will the innovation come from outside of the 30 mile long, 15 mile wide area of Silicon Valley? Or from outside of the technology community specifically? And will the, in, the innovations come from people with domain expertise? As was the case, for example, in New Zealand, where the innovations came from a partnership with software developers, but it was really people who understood cattle farming, in this case, who came up with the game-changing innovation. The second big question is, will the next wave of innovations come from startups or from big companies? And, and I think that this is, this is a really interesting question. So in the face of, you know, there are 10 other examples in the agriculture field along the lines of what I described with pasture meter. Are they gonna continue, continue to come from, you know, 28 year olds with access to early stage high risk capital and they then disrupt the big companies? Or are the big companies um, themselves going to be able to create space with inside their organization so that they can unleash the big innovations. And I'll come back to this. Uh, another field that I think is going to be important and sort of cut horizontally across just about every industry is the rise of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics. Now, there's been a lot of reporting on this, and there is a lot of hype, but I do think in this case, what the reality will be in four to six years is sort of equal to uh, what the reporting about it is today. And, you know, a thesis of mine here is essentially that the robots of the cartoons and movies of the 1970s are going to be the reality of the 2020s, and this is going to have a big impact on labor markets. So. Uh, there, and there are really two things that are driving this. The first is a mathematical breakthrough uh, in something called mapping belief space. There were historically things that were very difficult to program. Uh, there were very th things that were very difficult to model out mathematically and to program algorithmically for robots like grasping. Grasping might seem like something that's really straightforward. It's actually quite complex. Uh, but there have been breakthroughs just in the last 18 months in mapping belief space that are able to take robotics and automation from being dominantly two-dimensional to increasingly three-dimensional. And the second thing is cloud robotics, uh, fueled by artificial intelligence. So let's let's think back to the one of these movies from the 1970s. Let's imagine that let's imagine that C3PO walked through that door right now. You know, if, if C-3PO from Star Wars in 1976 walked through that door right now and, you know, noticed that he interrupted a speech, you'd say, oh, pardon me, excuse me, oh my, you know, go find an open seat. Now, for any of you who are familiar with what that would take from the sensory ability to recognize that he had interrupted a, a lecture, the cognition and the linguistic ability to be able to excuse himself, the mobility to be able to identify and take an open seat. That is hundreds of millions of dollars worth of hardware and software whirring in that gold gleaming body. And that's why we don't have C-3PO. But because of the cloud, the C-3PO of 2022, if he walked through that door right now, and remember, we're going from a world of 16 billion to 40 billion networked devices. So some of those will be sensors in the room. Others of that would be sensors on the C-3PO equivalent. If he walked into the room, sensors from the room and on C-3PO would feed information to the cloud. It would analyze what took place and then give instructions to C-3PO saying, excuse yourself excuse yourself in English, and we identify an open seat at the fourth table on the third to the left. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because what it means is that automate, automation, robotics, technology, 
is not going to just replace the labor of men with strong shoulders working in ports, factories, mills, and mines doing work that is manual and routine. What we are increasingly going to see with the next wave of artificial intelligence is labor substitution for work that is cognitive and non-routine. So people who go to work today wearing coats and ties as opposed to people who go to work with big thick calluses on their hands. And this is going to have a very significant impact on labor globally. And this was explained to me best by a guy named Terry Gu. Uh, how many of you have heard of Foxconn? It's about half of you. How many of you own an Apple or a Samsung device? All right. Apple or Samsung don't make devices. Foxconn makes them all. Foxconn has 973,000 employees. It's the Taiwanese company that creates football field sti football stadium size factories in coastal China where your iPhones and your Samsung Galaxies are all made. And Terry Gu, who's the founder and CEO of Foxconn, explained to me, even though he was sort of the father of the model of taking low cost labor from the Chinese interior, taking it to the coast, putting them in these massive factories and having people do automated work at very low cost labor. He said to me, he goes, I have 973,000 employees. He goes, but I'm not going to hire any more humans. He goes, I'm just going to hire robots now. And he goes, humans are little capex, lots of opex. He says, robots, lots of capex, no opex. He says, when I hire a human, maybe I buy him a business card. Maybe they get a computer for their desk. He goes, but every two weeks, they want to be paid. And the longer they work for me, the more they want to be paid. And they get sick, and they get pregnant, and they join unions. <laughs> and he goes, robots are different. He goes, I ha he goes, there are lots of capex. I have to buy the robot. But once I do, it's no opex. I can, they can work for 24 hours a day. And, they, and I don't have to give them a salary every two weeks. And so the C-3PO equivalent uh, that, would, that, in, that in the movie version would cost hundreds of millions of dollars, but in a world of artificial intelligence and cloud robotics can be a relatively lightweight, dumb device so long as it is internet connected, means that there are going to be new equi equilibrium points between labor be, between whether it is worth getting human labor or whether it is worth getting robotic labor and this is going to have a this is going to be very disorienting um, in our workforces and as i think about this um, you know i think a lot about the what the leaders in these and other industries of the future will be you know so in addition to the work that i've been doing uh, writing these last 3 years I also sit on boards. I sit on the board of directors of a publicly traded Swiss company. I sit on the board of directors of a couple privately held fast growing technology companies in the US. And I act as sort of a CEO coach to half a dozen uh, different entrepreneurs and coach ups and funds here. And there's some fascinating observations uh, that I would make, or some things that fascinate me at least, when I think about you know, relatively young people. And as, since I'm 44, I think of everybody who's under the age of 44 as young. Um, but especially millennials. And when I, when I think about who uh, is going to be imagining and inventing the industries of the future, there are some characteristics that have really struck me, uh, both positive and, at least in my estimation, less positive. So positively, one of the things that I'm consistently seeing uh, from these young executives, from these young entrepreneurs, is their innovation is non-derivative. I mean, they are seeing, they are seeing the world with completely open eyes. So when I started my company in 2000, you know, even though my company went from being modestly sized into being a successful global company, you know, most of my peers who were starting companies around then, you know, it was sort of a variant of what everybody else was doing. Uh, or, you know, oh, it's like pets.com, but for cats. 
Uh, and what's really interesting to me, to me now is to see the high-risk early-stage capital and the entrepreneurs themselves congregating around really interesting big challenges, you know, from space travel to genomics to not just building software but the hardware to go with it, you know, like the earpiece that you would put in your ear that will, you know, speak hundreds of languages to you. And so I do think there is something about having grown up digital. I didn't, you know, when I was in college, I didn't send or receive a single email. I didn't own a mobile phone until I was 28. I didn't post on social media until I was 35. And that's not to say that, you know, there is something entirely de deterministic and about, about an affinity for things digital with age, but I do think that for people who grew up digital, they are like fish in water, uh, more often than not, when it comes to these digital and these technological spaces. A and as such, I see the products that they are imagining and daring to build uh, being very interesting. Less positive, in my view, is the, is the changing nature of their place in, of their role in the workplace. So again, thinking back to myself, you know, when I left school, when I was in my 20s, when I was in my 30s, three years was considered to be a relatively short-term commitment to an employer. Like if you stayed someplace for three years, that was considered sort of the minimum period of respectability. And I would still argue today that if you aren't someplace for three years, like what did you actually learn while you were there? You know, working for somebody has to be, from my standpoint, the value proposition is not just the value that you're bringing to the enterprise, but it's also what are you learning from that? And for all of the, you know, young leaders who I encounter and who I mentor, what I see, you know, in kids with all sorts of fancy degrees who do not lack for opportunities, is their labor, their work, is going decreasingly from being employer-based to being project-based. And so I keep seeing these, these resumes and having discussions with these very impressive young people. And three years for them is like the longest term commitment they could ever imagine. And I do think that while they may have some very good technical skills, what I do believe is that it degrades their ability to learn certain skills when they are in the workplace around things like management, around things related to leadership and other such things. So I am seeing, you know, an almost, it's almost schizophrenia uh, among well-educated millennials, you know, who are changing employers or, you know, going project to project, who are living portfolio lifestyles, you know, at the age of 26. Uh, and so I do think that the, in the leaders of the future, uh, we are going to have to account for some of what millennials want and need in a workforce. And it'll be interesting to me to see the degree to which the market bends to their norms or the degree to which as they age, they have to pivot to what we, under, to what we value uh, within larger enterprises. Uh, when I'm asked about, well, what are the attributes, you know, what is the principal attribute that you look for um, in, a lead, in a leader of the industries of the future, I keep coming back to interdisciplinary learning. Um, you know, people, I think, consistently emphasize STEM, 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 science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And I think that's all good and well. Uh, but as I have worked uh, more and more closely with um, some extremely accomplished executives, and, and two stand out to me, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, who I do a fair amount of work with now at Facebook, and Eric Schmidt, uh, you know, the longtime CEO of Google, now the chairman of Alphabet. As I've gotten to know those two better, I've come to believe that Facebook, for example, which most of us probably think of as the product of a brilliant young computer scientist, I actually think that Facebook is as much a product 
of Mark Zuckerberg's expertise in behavioral psychology as it is his expertise in computer science. And when I think about Eric Schmidt, as I've gotten to know him much better, and as I've studied that period of more than 10 years where he served as the CEO of Google during its period of, of you know, remarkable growth globally, I've come to believe, yeah, he has a PhD in computer science from UC Berkeley, a great computer scientist. He was the CTO at Sun Microsystems. Uh, but you know what? You want to know what made him a, a great, uh, great CEO at Google for as long as he was? It was because of his zeal and his, his commitment to lifelong learning uh, and his expertise in international relations. And so while Google was not able to take all over 196 countries on planet Earth, part of why Eric Schmidt specifically was such a great CEO, in my opinion, was even though he has this stamp on him as a computer scientist, the truth is that the skills that he, exec that he exercised as a CEO were much more root in his, rooted in his expertise uh, in an international relations than as some super geek. And so when I do think about the industries of the future, I think that the, the great leaders will be those who blend an understanding of those things that are scientific and technological but who also uh, exhibit skills that we think of as being more rooted in the humanities, emotional intelligence, communication skills, economics, behavioral psychology. So uh, you know, while you might be able to hire great engineers who are you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, if what you're looking for are the great leaders in the industries of the future, I think that they are going to be increasingly interdisciplinary. And then the last thing that I would focus on uh, before getting into a few minutes of, of question and answer is the industries of the future are going to play out on a 196 country chessboard. Today's frontier markets are going to be tomorrow's developing markets, and today's developing markets are going to be tomorrow's developed markets. So, you know, if you look at who a lot of w what I consider to be, you know, the truly outstanding CEOs in Europe and the United States, if you sort of go back in their CVs a little bit, there's a shocking, con shocking number of them who had a period where they were the regional head for Asia Pacific. And so, you know, there was this period, you know, five to 15 years ago where, you know, a lot of people who now run the global enterprise had some, concerted period, had some concerted period of time focusing on the Asia Pacific, more often than not focusing on China, India, and South Korea. And that's not an accident. Uh, people, business leaders who are comfortable and who are especially adept at playing on a 196 country chessboard are gonna be those who compete and succeed most effectively. Uh, ironically, in a world growing more digital, I think that you can almost gauge somebody's effectiveness by the number of good old-fashioned ink stamps they have in their passport. Uh, but what's interesting is I think, you know, yes, a, a focus in history and big markets like China and India might be an indicator of somebody who's well prepared for today. But when I think about tomorrow, what I'm going to be looking at are who are those people who have learned how to build markets, who would have learned how to open up markets in what was the equivalent of China 15 years ago. I think about the 800 people in Sub-Saharan Africa. You know, when I graduated from college 20 some years ago, Sub-Saharan Africa was thought of as a center of conflict and development assistance. It's not anymore. <laughs> if you gave me a dollar and said, take this dollar and put it someplace on the globe where you think that dollar is going to appreciate the most over the next 10 years, I'm putting it over Sub-Saharan Africa. And so I do think that there are a number of frontier markets from, you know, we know that the Pacific facing countries of South America have been especially strong over the last 10 years while the, you know, the, the East facing, the Atlantic facing countries of South America have had choppier water. Well, you know, with some of the changes there, people who are willing to dig in and invest on the Atlantic facing countries of, the, of South America, those who are gonna be willing to spend a couple years 
in sub-Saharan Africa, those who are really going to be able to dig in and unleash East, Eastern Europe, those who are looking at frontier markets in East Asia, which are going to mainstream like Vietnam and Malaysia and others, I'm telling you that's what's next. And those leaders who are comfortable navigating across that 196 country chessboard uh, in a world that is not that is not going to grow less complicated, that is going to be characterized by fluctuating currencies, that is going to be characterized by geopolitical conflict. The ability to make pivots in your supply chains, the ability to understand how, where, and when to allocate capital and when not to on as big a chessboard as possible, uh, I believe, is going to be deterministic of who is especially well prepared to be a CEO in five years. And so, you know, as was mentioned during my, during my introduction, I do believe it's not the strongest of the, of the species who survive or the most intelligent, uh, but those most adaptable to change. And so with that, I've, I've got time for a few questions. Uh, again, I'm not a diplomat anymore, so please do feel free to ask undiplomatic questions challenge any of my assertions um, or ask about something that I just didn't bring up over the last 45 minutes. Yes, ma'am. It's digitized. It's the innovation for our industry. So what's your reaction to that? What's the next version of LinkedIn? I'm interested. Yeah, so I think the next version of LinkedIn is LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> I, I mean that not at all sarcastically. Uh, so LinkedIn, I think, is a really smart platform that is about to get a lot better. So I know Reed Hoffman pretty well. Um, and what he and his team did is he developed a place that I would say ha wasn't overly polluted by you know, a lot of the negative that we see in social networks. And I think that they did build a critical mass there, but they also hit a little bit of a ceiling in terms of the efficacy of the platform and having actually gotten a look at what their plans are for what's next, and it's very hard to overhaul a platform with hundreds of millions of users, I do believe um, that they are gonna generate substantially more value for employers, for job seekers, and for shareholders. So I actually, I actually think that the next LinkedIn is LinkedIn. Um, you know, it ha one thing I think there, I do think there, there's a bit of a limit uh, to, to the seniority uh, of the kind of people who you are likely to find there. And, you know, and this is part of what distinguishes search executives like yourselves from machines, right? I mean, there are things that can be done algorithmically to identify talent, but, but what you do is, is art and science. You know, yes, there are some aspects to it are, that are algorithmic, but you have to model things three-dimensionally with, with a degree of complexity, creativity, matching for personality, uh, being attentive to emotional intelligence and, and other such things, so that I think that LinkedIn will serve a function in job markets, but I actually, at the highest ends, I do not see the kinds of functions that you do being replaced by you know, technology platforms at all. And in fact, I believe that in a world where we are being nudged this way and that way by algorithms, at the high end, um, I think we increasingly value and we increasingly seek out the human touch. Um, and we increasingly ask questions that machines can't ask for us. We increasingly ask people to solve problems that can't be put into a computer program. Uh, so I think that LinkedIn uh, will serve a function, but I question the function it will play for you um, at the high end of your field. Yes, sir. So Alec, you craft a really interesting picture of leaders in the future. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about the capability of boards of directors to parse that field and select the kind of leaders that are going to have the skills and perspectives that you're talking about? Yeah, so I'm so, gl I'm so glad you brought that up. 
So first of all, let me actually say something about the composition of boards of directors. Um, you know, I sit on the board of a fancy Swiss publicly traded company. I'm 44 years old. I'm the youngest person on that board by 20 years. Um, and I do think as we think about diversity, uh, I really think that if you think about some of the fields, if you, th if you look at the agenda items on board of directors agendas, you know, cybersecurity threats, privacy policies, you know, existential threats coming from digitization, this thing. You know, there are so many things outside of the, the audit function, outside of the CEO and executive team coaching function. I think there is an imperative that we diversify the composition of these boards of directors so that they become less Western, white, male, and older. Um, it's not entirely diplomatic, but it's what I think. Um, we've got to bring diversity. And that's not to say you need to bring a bunch of 22-year-olds in, but you should bring some 42-year-olds in. And we definitely need more women. We definitely need more non-Americans and non-Brits. I mean, we just, we need to diversify that. So, to the question of how do boards, of, how prepared are boards of directors to parse this out? Uh, I, th you know, it's hard, first of all, to make a sweeping generalization about boards of directors because they are so wildly diverse. Uh, but in many of those that I've been exposed to, uh, I think they're relatively poorly prepared because their own grasp of the issues uh, on, on, they have a good grasp of today's issues, but they don't always have a good grasp of tomorrow's issues. They're disoriented by it. What they know is what they read in an Economist article. And so I think that the step here is that we need more board, board education, but the real way of fixing this is with board diversity. Yes, sir. Alec, you've obviously had the opportunity to travel the globe, but coming back closer to North America, for uh, these millennials, startup and technology companies, we've got lots of bright, brilliant ideas, but raising capital, we're from the southeast, yep. but raising capital compared to Silicon Valley, what are we doing to sort of raise awareness of funding these great inventions, innovation? Yes, yeah, so this is, a, this is why I don't believe in efficient markets. Um, the overwhelming concentration of venture capital in Boston, New York, to a degree Washington DC, a little bit in Chicago, Austin, Southern California, Northern California, that's it. Everything else is sort of cute by comparison. Um, so there are two ways of looking at it. I mean, on the one hand, if you wanna make a lot of money, it suggests to me that there's an underserved market there. Now there are people like Steve Case who used to be the CEO of AOL Time Warner who sort of built his entire venture model around what he calls the rise of the rest. Um, but you know, that's just $300 million in a much larger pool. So what I, can say, what I believe is that part of why there has been the m migration to California, and let's take the United States out of it. What about France and Italy and you know, all these other places around the globe that don't have access to that capital. I think that part of why we see much, so much entrepreneurship in places like New York and California and others is above and beyond the lifestyle. And you know, look, 20-somethings and 30-somethings oftentimes like living in cities like this one or living in San Francisco. It's the access to capital. And venture capitalists can be exceedingly parochial. You know, a lot, there's a lot of conditionality put on the dollars where you know, they want them to be within 30 minutes of Sand Hill Road. And so in the Southeast, I consider it, um, I do consider it a big drag uh, on innovation and entrepreneurship. One other thing that I'll say though, is that there's a section in the book that I hope you'll read about, you know, what are the characteristics that states and societies need to nurture innovation? And one thing that I do believe is a virtue of millennials is that they, they value openness. Upward, upward economic and social mobility not being constrained to, to uh, elites, religious and cultural values not being sent from a central authority, and radically rights respecting, whether those are you know, racial, ethnic, minority, gender rights. And so another thing that I think we need to recognize is you know, there was just a decision in, in Mississippi 
that effectively legalizes discrimination against homosexuals. That, they might as well call that law the anti-innovation startup law. Because I got news, there are very distinct cultural characteristics among the people who are imagining and building these businesses. And they will not domicile their businesses in what they will consider to be more closed societies. They really value openness. And they will congregate in those places that are wildly open. And so, you know, I've spoken, you know, I talked to Dmitry Medvedev, you know, back when he was president of Russia, you know, about Skolkovo and, uh, and, you know, Crown Prince in Dubai. You know, they're wondering why for all the money they put in Skolkovo, trying to create the Silicon Valley of Russia and all the things that they did in Dubai, you know, why were they not innovating? And it goes often in both of those cases to, I believe, a set of cultural norms. Um, so in that case, they actually had the access to capital, but the cultural norms were negatively deterministic for them. I have time for two more questions. Yes, sir. So um, as an industry, when we are looking to find senior leaders and executives, it seems to me we are still following the same 25 to 50-year-old formula. We're looking for certain characteristics in terms of the experience, mm -hmm. the wisdom, what kind of firms they have served at, and looking for those blue chip names on their resume. As you look, you know, in your analysis of the industry of the future, are we well served by following the same old formula? If not, how can we challenge ourselves to go beyond that for the next wave? Well, you know, first I think it's important for me to show a measure of humility. You know, I know so much less about your industry than you do. You know, so I do, I do want to, you know, sort of make that point. You know, having said that, if part of what you're interested is in is finding the most talented 30-year-old, you know, I'm 44. So 15 years ago, finding the most talented 29-year-old, you would have found him at McKinsey, you know, PwC, Goldman. You know, I can give you the list of 12 or 15 people, uh, 12 or 15 places. Right now, those places, with some notable exceptions, tend to get the second best. And the very best tend to either be at one of the big platform companies, Google, Facebook, Apple, but more often than not, I see a lot of the most talented people of that age going, you know, making interesting bets and working in some of these startups. You know, you look at, you know, the best people coming out of HBS or out of Sloan or, you know, out of Tuck or out of Wharton or even those who didn't, you know, didn't go to business school, a lot of them want to be a part of a growth story. They don't want to be, they don't even want to be a part of Google. They, Google in 2016, they want to be a part of Google in 2002. And so the question for me is that's less important than the name on the resume is why is that name on the resume? Why did you work at that company? You know, you score really well, you've got this MBA, you were a, you know, you were a Marshall Scholar at Oxford. Why did you work at this company I've never heard of before? So the answer to the why, to me, is actually more important than the where. Any last question? Great. Well, listen, thank you all. Um, I think you all got copies of the Industries of the Future, so I hope you get a chance to read and enjoy it. Thank you very much.